Hello everybody, uh, today we're going to look at ethical egoism, which is a view in uh, moral philosophy. And the basic idea of ethical egoism is that uh, morally you ought to uh, maximise your own self-interest, your own welfare, your own happiness alone. You should not be concerned about the fortunes of other people, uh, and you should help other people only insofar as this will be of benefit to you. So it's morally obligatory for you to benefit yourself, morally wrong for you to sacrifice your own welfare to benefit others. Uh, now, as a point of clarification, it's worth distinguishing ethical egoism from what we might call personal egoism. Uh, ethical egoism, as I mentioned, this says that each person ought to do only what is in their own self-interest. Personal egoism, by contrast, says simply, I ought to do only what is in my own interest and it doesn't say anything about what anybody else ought to do. So ethical egoism is uh, kind of universalised. It tells, it says how everybody ought to act, whereas personal egoism is, is just about me. Um, now this is a very important distinction. Uh, I could adopt personal egoism as a rule for living my own life, but since it's only concerned with my own behaviour and says nothing about anybody else, it doesn't really seem to be a moral theory. Uh, moral principles need to be universal in some sense, they need to direct the behaviour of all moral agents. Uh, indeed, actually, personal egoism is arguably not even a form of egoism, because if you remove the uh, indexical, you, um, you just get it, you just get Kane Baker ought to do what is in Kane Baker's self-interest. Um, and if anybody else endorsed this view, there wouldn't be anything inherently egoistic about that. Um, on the other hand, if you were to say that personal egoism is a rule that should be adopted by everybody, uh, so everybody should endorse uh, the claim that I ought to do what is in my own self-interest, you know, referring to themselves, well obviously that's just ethical egoism. Uh, that would just be to say that, that everybody ought to do what is in their own self-interest. Um, so anyway, we're going to be looking at, at ethical egoism. Now we can distinguish a few different types of ethical egoism. For example, uh, we could adopt a consequentialist egoism or a virtue egoism. Consequentialist egoism says uh, that you uh, ought to act so as to maximize your own utility exclusively. And this has a similar form to utilitarianism, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Uh, this is a view that the right action is whatever maximizes utility in general, where everyone's utility should be given equal consideration. Uh, the greatest happiness for the greatest number is the slogan of utilitarianism. You should be impartial. Try to maximise the utility of all. Consequentialist egoism has a similar form. It, it just says, well, maximise your own utility exclusively. Place no importance on anybody else's utility. Uh, another kind of egoism would be virtue egoism. This is a kind of virtue ethics. Uh, and so this kind of view might say that uh, selfishness is a virtue or it's, it's virtuous to be motivated only by self-interest. Um, and, and similarly, any character trait that would tend to improve one's own welfare is also a virtue. Uh, so uh, discipline, courage, intelligence, temperance, many of these standard virtues uh, will, will be of benefit to you. So uh, they would also be considered virtues according to virtue egoism. Uh, and virtue ego egoism will also say that a trait like, uh, I guess we could call it calculated beneficence, uh, so being charitable in ways that benefit you, helping others in ways that ultimately benefit you, uh, that's also going to be a virtue. So you might make big public donations to charity to raise your public profile, or uh, you could donate to charities that will help improve your own life, like how a, a gay man might donate to a charity that promotes more gay rights, for instance. Uh, virtue egoism would, would support that kind, of, that kind of character trait. But traits that tend to encourage concern for other people, uh, traits like sympathy, compassion, pity, these would be vices. Uh, virtue egoism would say that you know, a person of good moral character is somebody who has cultivated the selfish traits and suppressed the altruistic ones. Uh, now, in this video, I'm not going to put too much emphasis on these differences. Uh, we're going to talk about ethical egoism in fairly general terms. Um, but, you know, still, it's, it's worth bearing in mind that you can develop the theory in these, in these different ways. Um, OK, uh, also, just a final point of clarification is that ethical egoism doesn't say that you should just 
you know, pursue whatever would bring you the most pleasure in the moment, right? I mean, there are many things I might want to do, but that would not promote my interests. Uh, I, I really hate exercising, for instance. I, I absolutely, I absolutely hate it. In the short term, I would prefer to just be lazy. But of course, what I really want is a long and healthy life and exercising is important to achieve that. Uh, I would regrettably have to agree that doing a bit of exercise every day is worth the benefits of a longer life expectancy. So if I were to give in to my immediate urges to be lazy and never exercise, ethical egoism would condemn this as a very serious moral failing. Um, I would be sacrificing my, you know, my, my, my stronger, longer term interests for, sh for short term pleasure. Um, so, you know, ethical egoism is not the idea that you should as I say, that you should just pursue your immediate pleasures, right? It's supposed to be a kind of, you know, uh, rational, enlightened, it's enlightened theory that says, you know, you've, you've got you've got to think very carefully and and act so as to promote your long term interests. Now, ethical egoism is a fairly unpopular doctrine in moral philosophy, as is the case for most general moral theories. There are not so many clear arguments in favour of ethical egoism. There are many arguments against it. But um, in this video, I'm going to look at some arguments in favour of it. We'll look at the objections in the next video. So uh, what are the arguments for ethical egoism? Well, one argument begins by asserting psychological egoism. Now, this is the claim that uh, just as a matter of fact, uh, all people always do act in their own self-interest. So this is just a descriptive claim about what people are actually like. Uh, ethical egoism, of course, is a normative claim. Psychological egoism is a descriptive claim. Uh, it just says that, that in fact, people are in fact motivated by self-interest. It's impossible. It's impossible to do otherwise. We are never and, and we can never be genuinely concerned for other people. Now, I mean, obviously it's true that we often act in ways that benefit others. We act in ways that might seem to be altruistic, but the psychological egoists would say that we're always ultimately aiming for some benefit to ourselves. So, for instance, there is reciprocal altruism. I see that you are in need of food, so I give you some of my food with the expectation that if I'm ever in need of food in the future, you will give me yours, right? So there's a, there's a kind of tit for tat thing going on there. That kind of thing isn't genuine altruism, because my, my goal here is to make sure that I will receive food from you if I need to in the future. Um, and the idea of psychological egoism is that on analysis, even the most seemingly selfless actions will turn out uh, to be self-interested. They will turn out to have arisen from self-interested motives. And if this is true, it seems that we're forced to accept ethical egoism. If it is impossible for people to act selflessly, then it makes no sense to adopt a moral theory that requires them to do that. I mean, there's a, there's a sort of gen general consensus that to say that a person ought to do X implies that they can do X, that X is within their power. You can't be morally obligated to do something impossible. Uh, according to psychological egoism, no person can be motivated by genuine concern for anything other than their own welfare. So that would, that would seem to leave ethical egoism as the only option for a, an ethical theory. Um, now, there are many problems with this argument. Uh, one problem is, even if this does, in a sense, establish ethical egoism, it also makes ethical egoism completely trivial. Uh, because what this argument says is, nobody does anything selfless anyway, right? Everybody already is selfish. Even in, you know, nobody can, even in principle, act selflessly. Uh, so, you know, I think when you first encounter ethical egoism, it comes across as a fairly striking and, uh, and, and radical theory. Uh, it, it, it completely overturns our usual way of thinking about morality. And, and you think, well, this is going to lead to some pretty massive changes in our behavior if we were to adopt that uh, as, a, as a moral theory. But if you accept this argument from psychological egoism, then ethical egoism is not really interesting at all um, because everybody already does act entirely in, the, in their self-interest and that's all they can do, right? Um, I mean, it's like if somebody were to say uh, it, it would be morally wrong to destroy all of the protons in the universe. Well, yeah, okay, maybe it would, but nobody can do that anyway, right? So it's kind of trivial. Um, perhaps more importantly, though, 
psychological egoism seems to face some pretty obvious problems. I mean, surely there are some cases where people sacrifice their own welfare for others. I mean, not every altruistic act can be explained as a result of, uh, you know, as, as being ultimately self-interested in the way that, you know, reciprocal altruism can. Just think about cases where somebody gives to charity anonymously and there's, you know, there's no chance of any kind of long-term benefit for them. Nobody even knows that they've done it. Uh, I mean, surely that would be a purely altruistic action, wouldn't it? Well, there is a standard response to these kinds of cases. Um, there's a, a famous story that's often told in moral philosophy. I don't know whether this story is actually true, but the story goes that uh, Abraham Lincoln was riding a carriage with a friend and he was arguing in favour of psychological egoism. So he was saying people only ever act in their own self-interest. And then the carriage passed a mudslide where uh, a mother pig was trying to save her piglets from drowning. Lincoln stopped the carriage, got out and saved the piglets. And so his friend said, well, you know, haven't you obviously acted selflessly here? But Lincoln countered that if he didn't save the piglets, he, he would have felt very guilty, which is an unpleasant feeling. He saved the piglets to ensure his own peace of mind. So in general then, if I let bad things happen to other people, I will experience negative feelings of guilt. Whereas if I help them, I will experience a sense of satisfaction, a positive, a positive feeling. So really I'm helping them for my own benefit, not for theirs. And of course, we can say this about any altruistic behavior. In all cases, I do what I most want to do. I aim to satisfy my own desires, even if those desires are uh, for the welfare of other people. Letting other people suffer would bring me down, whereas helping them would you know, give me a sense of satisfaction. So by helping them, I help myself. That's the, um, that's the sort of response a psychological egoist might make. The problem with this response is that it seems to make psychological egoism uh, a completely uninteresting and trivial theory, and it sort of seems to be you know, redefining the very concept of selfishness and selflessness, because surely the point of distinguishing between selfish and selfless actions is, well, you know, we sometimes uh, you know, we, we sometimes want to benefit ourselves without thinking about other people and, you know, we sometimes want to benefit others even though, you know, this, this won't bring us any particular, you know, any specific material gains. Uh, if I want to help others, if I derive satisfaction from helping others, then by definition I'm not selfish. I'm not an egoist in any interesting sense. Uh, the feelings of guilt that Lincoln would have experienced had he not saved the pigs, that just is compassion, that just is altruism. After all, I mean, you know, one way to think about this is, well, if Lincoln were genuinely selfish, why would he feel any guilt about leaving the piglets to die? If you only care about yourself, what would, what would provoke the guilt? I mean, there are people, there are psychopaths out there who who, who wouldn't care about that. They'd be perfectly happy to watch the piglets drown, uh, or they'd be perfectly happy to drown the piglets themselves, and they just wouldn't care. Um, so, you know, surely the, the important distinction there is, is precisely the fact, you know, the point is precisely the fact that Lincoln would feel guilt about leaving them to die. That is precisely uh, what, what makes him selfless and compassionate. Um, you know, a, self, a selfish person is going to be somebody who helps grudgingly because they reason that it will be in their best interest in the long run. An unselfish person, a selfless person, is precisely the person who derives genuine satisfaction from helping and who would feel guilt about leaving others to suffer. So perhaps it's true that we only do what we desire to do, but the important question is, what do you desire to do? If you desire to benefit only yourself and you care nothing for others, this is uh, selfish and egoistic. If you desire to help others, uh, where this will do nothing um, but bring satisfaction and it, and it won't bring any other material or social benefits or anything, then that's selfless. Uh, what matters is the object of your desire. So I think psychological egoism is really only an interesting doctrine if it says something like, uh, you know, we never have concern for other people. And that's obviously false. 
correspondingly, uh, if ethical egoism is to be an interesting doctrine, it would need to say it would need to say something like you should not have concern for other people, right? You you shouldn't get satisfaction and pleasure from helping people. That's a that would be an inappropriate uh, response. Feelings of satisfaction are only appropriate when you have received some benefit to yourself. Um, I think that would be uh, an interesting form of ethical egoism. Uh, so I don't find this argument especially convincing. Okay, another argument for ethical egoism is that altruistic behaviour makes society worse off. Uh, behaving selfish, selfishly would promote the common good. Society as a whole would be better off if everybody looked out for themselves. Now, of course, if we're concerned about promoting the common good, we're not ethical egoists. So uh, uh, no ethical egoist would want to say that we should act selfishly because it is a means to achieve uh, you know, the, the common good of society as a whole. Uh, I think instead the way to understand this argument is that it's, it's basically saying that altruism is self-defeating, right? Uh, concern for the good of all is self-defeating. So the idea here is the whole point of, of altruism is to uh, you know, Im improve the good of your community as a whole rather than just yourself. But if people behave altruistically, this will make the community as a whole worse off. So it's, so it's kind of self-undermining, self-defeating. Ethical egoism is not self-defeating in this way, so it's more appealing as a moral system. Um, so why, why, why would we think that altruistic behaviour would reduce the common good? Uh, there are a couple of reasons we might cite. First of all, I know my own desires and my own circumstances better than I know anybody else's. I am the best placed to try to pursue my own desires. My knowledge of your desires and circumstances, on the other hand, is, uh, is imperfect. I mean, especially if you're a stranger, I might know hardly anything about you. So there's a good chance that by trying to help you, I'm going to mess it up and make your situation worse. For example, let's say you decide to uh, support a project for building a new water delivery system in a foreign country where there's very little access to clean water. So you decide to give some money charitably to this, this project. But then it turns out that most of the money gets stolen by uh, the corrupt government in the area. And since there's nobody to properly maintain the, the water system that does get built, it soon degrades and, and starts poisoning those who use it. I mean, we can easily come up with examples like these where charitable behaviour just leads to more problems in the long run because the circumstances of the situation have not been, have not been properly understood. Uh, a second reason for worrying about altruistic behaviour uh, appeals to the uh, invisible hand argument that uh, is found in economics. So the idea here is that if everybody in a free market competes and tries to gain the most for themselves, this will produce various unintended social benefits. Free trade by self-interested individuals will tend to automatically produce socially desirable ends, as if those individuals were directed by an invisible hand. Uh, as a simple example to see how this works, suppose that I grow strawberries and I decide to act altruistically. I set a very low price on my strawberries, um, let's say one penny for a whole box, and I also just give many boxes away for free to people who seem needy. Obviously the main problem with this is I won't be making any money. I will start struggling to survive, I'll be unable to keep my business going, I won't even be able, I won't be able to even consider implementing measures to expand my business and grow more strawberries or other fruits or anything like that. On the other hand, suppose I'm acting selfishly. Suppose I'm just trying to increase my own wealth. Well, you might think that, that, that being selfish like this would make me push the prices unreasonably high. But the problem is, if I start price gouging, well, I mean, there'd be two problems. First, most people would just stop buying the strawberries. They'd buy other fruits instead. I'd lose almost all my customers just because they can't afford the product. So I'd probably end up making less money overall. Uh, second, even worse for me, it's likely that a competitor strawberry producer would arise who would sell, the, who would sell strawberries more cheaply. And so then all of my potential customers would go to this producer instead. So if I'm acting purely on self-interest, 
I'll actually be driven to apply a fair price to the strawberries, uh, a price that allows them to be sold to the maximum number of people while also making enough profit for me to comfortably maintain and expand my business. Similarly, uh, consider the point of view of the consumer. The selfish consumer, you might think, would just, I don't know, try to steal my strawberries. But that's not really the case because given the laws against theft and given that I have an incentive to protect my product, um, so I, you know, I might harm or at least inform on anybody I catch trying to steal, the wisest option for the selfish consumer is just to pay the fair price. Now, this is a very simple example, uh, but this kind of reasoning supports the idea that self-interested behavior uh, ultimately improves the common, the common good. Um, you know, it will ultimately lead to a, a stable system that you know, supports growth and innovation and, and so on. Now, the main problem I think with this general argument is that while these kinds of points may be true in general, there seem to be very obvious exceptions. So regarding the first point about how you know, I, I, I know my own desires better than I know anybody else's, uh, well, yes, it's true that I'm not intimately familiar with the desires of strangers, but I mean, I do have some useful knowledge of their desires. I know perfectly well that the vast majority of people in the world want clean water and good food and, and you know, because they explicitly say so and because they perform actions to try to get these things. Um, and there are plenty of situations where, you know, it's, it's pretty obvious that you can, you can behave charitably without making their situation worse. If you come across somebody who's lost in the desert and they say, you know, please give me some water and they start grabbing at your water bottle. Well, it's perfectly obvious what they want. And it's also pretty obvious that giving them a bit of water is, uh, is unlikely to make their circumstances worse. Um, similarly, the, the invisible hand argument, that applies to certain kinds of market systems. Uh, it's not even intended to apply to all human behavior in general. Uh, and again, you know, it's hard to see how giving some water to the desperately thirsty person in the desert could could harm society overall. I mean, it's certainly not going to impair my own ability to make contributions to society in the future. Uh, I, I'm not going to lose all my money and be unable to uh, survive and grow my business just because I've given a bit of water to a thirsty person. Um, and indeed, giving this person water will, if anything, probably improve society. Uh, if you consider, you know, a, a person who is focused only on survival. Like if I'm desperately thirsty, if, if a person is desperately thirsty and they're focused only on survival, well, this person will be unable to do things that might benefit others. They will be unable to, you know, set up a new business or pursue creative ideas or, uh, you know, make wonderful artworks. Only once each individual's basic needs for food, water, shelter, and so on are fulfilled, will they usually start pursuing the, the, the loftier sort of projects that will benefit society as a whole. Um, so, you know, I mean, it's, it's fair enough that we have to be careful with charitable behaviour. Just blindly throwing money at a problem may well make the situation worse. You know, you've, you've got to be rational and consider the circumstances and so on, just as you have to with self-interested actions. Uh, but I think it's extremely implausible that all kinds of selfless, charitable behavior will leave other people worse off. A very interesting argument for ethical egoism is proposed by Edward Regis in his article Ethical Egoism and Moral Responsibility. Uh, actually, Regis uh, defended a more moderate form of ethical egoism than what we're discussing here, but his argument can still uh, be applied here. So the uh, basic argument goes like this. Um, premise, premise one, each person is solely morally responsible for the fact of their own being in need. Premise two, uh, no person is morally obligated to satisfy needs that they are not responsible for creating. So conclusion, no person is morally obligated to satisfy the needs of any other person. Um, all right, so premise one, that, that each person is morally responsible for their own being in need. Regis's justification for this is that all needs are a result of free choices people make uh, for which they're fully responsible. Uh, the idea here is that needs are determined by one's goals. Uh, take, for instance, my need to drink water. 
Um, that I would say that's a basic need for, of, of mine, right? But I need to drink water in order to survive. Suppose I no longer uh, have the goal of continued life. Maybe um, let's say I'm, I'm very old and I've, I've got some serious illness that's, that's caused me to be paralyzed and in constant pain. And I, I just feel that, you know, I've, I've lived a full and rich life and I uh, don't, don't want to continue uh, on anymore. Uh, well, in that case, I don't need water. Instead, I would, what I would need is some method to end my life. Um, so m my need to drink water, that's not some kind of uncontrollable given, right? That, that need exists only relative to my goal of continued survival. Um, and obviously, I mean, the same is true of other needs like food or shelter or freedom from assault um, and so on. Uh, need then is a three place relation to say X needs Y that's incomplete. It should be X needs Y in order to achieve goal Z. The goal generates the need. But if all of uh, but but all of my um, genuine goals have been freely chosen without coercion. You can't literally force somebody to choose a particular goal or to abandon a particular goal. For example, let's say uh, Frank is uh, homosexual and one of his long-term goals is to marry a man. Well, he might live somewhere where gay marriage is illegal. Indeed, maybe he lives somewhere where any kind of homosexual behavior is illegal. That might prevent him from achieving his goal. And it might prevent him from openly saying that this is his goal, but it won't prevent him from, from having the goal. Um, you know, you, you can't, there's nothing we can do to Frank to prevent him from, from having that goal, the, the, the goal of marrying a man. Incidentally, it's important to distinguish between goals and desires. Goals are freely chosen. Desires arguably are not. Uh, you can't generally control your desires. I might desire to eat large quantities of chocolate cake because it's tasty, but I don't have the goal of eating large quantities of chocolate cake. Uh, indeed, my goal uh, is to cut down on the chocolate cake. So goals are often based on desires, but a goal is a free choice. Um, you know, a goal is something you aim to achieve, whereas desires just arise within you uncontrollably. So, so, so uh, I've freely chosen all of my goals. And since I have freely chosen all of my goals, uh, I and only I am responsible for those goals. My needs arise only as a result of my goals, so I and only I am responsible for all of my needs. Nobody else is, is similarly responsible for my needs. Um, so that's premise one. As for premise two, well here Regis uh, asserts what he calls a, a negative principle of responsibility. Um, he says, needs for whose existence one is not responsible are needs for whose satisfaction one is not responsible. You have no uh, obligation to satisfy needs that you did not create. Uh, if your need is due to goals that you have chosen and that you could just as easily choose to change, you know, why should anybody else be responsible for satisfying that need? Um, you know, the, the, the need exists simply as a result of your choice to, uh, to have a particular goal. Um, so, you know, we get this egoist conclusion that no person is morally obligated to satisfy the needs of any other person. There are, there are no constraints on how you can behave towards other people. Now, of course, one obvious problem with this kind of argument is that many ethical theories would uh, simply deny the second premise. I mean, according to utilitarianism, for example, all needs matter equally and should be given equal consideration. We're responsible for satisfying um, all other needs, and it's totally irrelevant who is responsible for creating the needs. Um, so, uh, yeah, so premise two certainly isn't, isn't just obvious. Another problem is that uh, with this, like with, with premise one, um, that each person is solely responsible for their own being in need, that doesn't apply to uh, babies or to animals uh, because they're not morally responsible for anything. Uh, they don't have the capacity to make choices, uh, or at least, you know, n not in the kind of sense that, that adults do. I mean, they do, they do choose things, but we wouldn't hold them responsible for their choices. Um, now, of course, I'm not responsible for creating the 
whatever needs a baby has, but perhaps there's a sense in which its parents are responsible. Similarly, if you, I don't know, choose to, you know, buy an buy an animal, um, then you know, and have it as a pet, then maybe you're responsible for its its needs. Also, there might be some science fiction scenarios where, you know, the the evil neuroscientist alters somebody's brain, and so creates their goals. So in that situation, the neuroscientist would be responsible for their needs. So this argument perhaps doesn't get us to uh, true ethical egoism. It doesn't get us all the way to um, to the idea that you are, you are you should be you should be focused solely on your own self interest. But but it does get us close, right? I mean, g generally speaking, you shouldn't have any concern whatsoever for the you know the the, the needs of, of other people. Okay, another argument begins with the question, why should we be moral? Why behave in morally good ways when it would be in my self-interest to be bad? Um, this is one of those big questions of moral philosophy. Uh, in Plato's Republic, he tells the story of the Ring of Gyges. Uh, a shepherd comes upon a ring that he can use to make himself invisible, and with the power of invisibility, he commits various morally bad acts to his own benefit. We want to condemn the shepherd, but then, you know, why should he do otherwise? Uh, it seems like the shepherd could say, well, I have a reason to do things that are in my own interests and no other reason for action. There's no reason to be moral, no reason for me to do the right thing, uh, if the right thing is not in my own self-interest. Uh, and so, you know, the question is, can we come up with a compelling argument against this kind of view? What we need here is an argument that would convince somebody who simply doesn't care about morality that they have a good reason to care. Alison Hills in her book The Beloved Self calls this the holy grail of moral philosophy. Now I mean people will disagree about how serious this problem is. Speaking for myself, I, I, this is not a question that I find all that interesting or troubling. But if you do find this question troubling, then the ethical egoist has a very simple response for you, because she will say the moral action just is whatever action is in your interests. So, you know, to ask the question, why be moral rather than do what is in my own interests, that's not sensible. That's, ju that, that's just a silly question. Uh, because, you know, because, because the moral action is the action that is in your own self-interest. So that gives us a pretty straightforward solution to this problem. Um, a pretty radical solution to this problem, and you might actually argue that this looks less like solving the problem and more, more like just capitulating. Uh, you know, have we, have we really solved the problem or have we just given up? Um, but you know, if it, an ethical egoist, as I say, does, does have a, a pretty simple response there. Uh, before I end, actually, it's, it's worth noting that this this particular argument raises an important question about ethical egoism because some philosophers have suggested that ethical egoism is not actually a moral theory at all so you know you might say that the ethical ego the egoism not not necessary not, not ethical egoism but but egoism is the is the rational position in the sense that you know pe people should be egoists so if if you are granted the power of guy jesus ring it it would be irrational of you not to use it for your own benefit even if this harms others uh, but even so it might be argued this isn't a moral theory right ethical egoism is not actually an ethical theory the intuition here is that the whole point of morality is to be concerned with the good of others, the common good. The function of morality as a social institution is to regulate people's behaviour so as to produce the best outcomes for society as a whole. And as such, morality makes demands on us beyond our own wishes. Morality demands that we uh, take into consideration the needs of others. I mean, that the whole, the whole reason why uh, morality exists is because people's desires and goals conflict and you know we we need to have some sort of system for for regulating that and producing the outcome that is that is best and most fair and most just so what we've called ethical egoism just isn't a moral theory now there are a few things to to say about this uh, is it true that ethical theories are concerned simply with the good of others well i mean certainly not exclusively virtue ethics for instance focuses on excellence of character 
where this involves developing traits that will be of benefit to the person who bears them. The primary question for virtue ethics is not how should I treat other people, but more generally, what is it to live a good life? Uh, and that's going to include character traits that, you know, that as I say, are of, of benefit to you as an individual. Virtue ethics focuses on you know, the flourishing of the individual, uh, uh, improving the individual's character. Interestingly, one of the standard criticisms of virtue ethics is precisely that it's too egoistic because the acquisition of virtues is, um, is primarily about improving the agent's own well-being, the agent's own flourishing. So that's, so, so certainly there are, you know, other moral systems that are kind of focused on the self, that, that don't just focus on uh, how you should, you know, how you're obligated to behave towards other people, the good of other people. Now, like other moral systems, uh, ethical egoism is an answer to the question, how ought we to act? And the answer is universal. All people uh, should act in their own self-interest and should never act against their self-interest for the benefit of others. So, so this, this obligation is, is one that applies to all. We all have this obligation to pursue our own self-interest. And in this respect, ethical egoism uh, makes demands on all people. And these are, uh, these are quite significant demands. Remember, ethical egoism doesn't say, well, you should just do whatever you want to do. People often have compassionate and sympathetic motives, which may lead them to act selflessly against their self-interest. Ethical egoism regards this as morally wrong and holds that we should suppress such drives. I mean, that's, that's tough. It's not an, an easy matter. Uh, the, the majority of people feel sympathetic emotions towards others. So like other, like other moral theories then, uh, ethical egoism uh, it does make demands on people. It, furthermore, I mean, people often have motives uh, that are concerned neither with the welfare of the self or the welfare of others. Uh, consider something like a sense of duty to tell the truth. This is something that we're incul inculcated with when learning philosophy. You know, philosophers have a duty to speak honestly, to follow the argument wherever it leads. Now, expressing oneself truthfully isn't necessarily going to improve anybody's welfare. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it, it's not necessarily going to be of the benefit of others or the benefit of yourself. Um, ethical egoism would, would reject this kind of concern for the truth. If I know that I will get I don't know, a better mark on an essay by lying and misrepresenting my actual views. Ethical egoism says I should do it. You know, if, if, I, if I can make lots of uh, money by um, and pretending to hold views that I, that I actually don't, uh, then again, ethical egoism says I should, I should do it. So in the same way that non-egoists may have selfish motivations that they struggle to overcome, the ethical egoist is going to have various selfless drives that she struggles to overcome. Ethical egoism will even disapprove of some selfish actions. Ethical egoism says you should live, you should, you should uh, act in your own self-interest, but of course we're all weak. Uh, we might want to be healthy and live long lives, or you know we might want to be successful in business and earn lots of money and so on, and yet we might eat poor diets or not do enough exercise or not commit ourselves to our work or fail to be assertive around others and back down when we would be better off standing our ground. Uh, we might not bother thinking very carefully about what we actually want in life and we, we might end up having contradictory desires and goals that will be impossible to satisfy. The ethical egoist will, uh, re will, will condemn this kind of thing as just undisciplined and lazy and, and a, a serious moral wrong because you're not acting in your own interests if you're lazy in this kind of way. So this is very different to um, liberal moralities, which often hold that moral, view, moral rules are concerned with your treatment of other people, while your treatment of yourself is not generally considered to be morally important. Um, ethical egoism, by contrast, is a, a morality of personal excellence. It, it treats the self as being of central importance, and so uh, it, it matters a great deal how you treat yourself. We can sort of place moral theories on a, a bit of a spectrum in terms of how much emphasis they place on concern for others versus concern for 
the self. Maybe actually concern isn't quite the right word here. Perhaps it should be more uh, constraints imposed on your behavior towards others versus constraints imposed on your behavior towards the self. Um, but you know, hopefully you get the general idea. Uh, on one extreme, on the, the left here, there's what I'm calling uh, deontological libertarianism. Uh, so this basically says you have, you have no obligations uh, to yourself, provided your actions have no effect on other people, provided your actions don't violate the rights of other people, there's just no moral question to be raised. You can do whatever the hell you like, no problems at all, right? If you want to take loads of drugs, um, you know, uh, eat really unhealthily, uh, you know, just go and visit loads of prostitutes and so on, that's fine for the deontological libertarian. Don't harm anybody else, don't steal anything from anybody else, you know, don't violate other people's rights. You can do anything, there's just no moral issue. Very close to this extreme would be a kind of naive utilitarianism that says you should maximize everybody's happiness in a totally impartial way. So on this sort of standard utilitarianism, your happiness, yourself, right, that does matter a little bit. Uh, it would be it would be morally wrong for you to make yourself unhappy unless this produces greater happiness in others. But um, obviously, because you have to count, you have to treat everybody everybody's happiness equally, uh, utilitarianism is, is pretty far over, um, over to the left there. Um, then there would be, perhaps going a bit further to the right, something like the ethics of care, which is focused on interpersonal relationships and uh, and and sort of social networks of support and so on. Uh, then in the middle there would be perhaps virtue ethics. Um, maybe various religious moralities would be in the middle as well. Uh, so religion often imposes many restrictions on your behaviour towards yourself. I mean, think about I mean, one of the main source of restrictions is usually sex, right? There's a lot of religions historically that have said masturbation is morally wrong. Obviously that's something that only affects the self. And then on the other extreme, there's ethical egoism. You have no obligations whatsoever to other people, but many obligations to the self. So, you know, I just think that perhaps viewing ethical egoism on this kind of spectrum with other moral systems, perhaps shows that it, that it does it should be taken seriously as uh, an alternative moral system. So it so it so it is genuine a genuinely uh, moral theory. Uh, anyway, in the next video we will look at the objections to ethical egoism. But that's all for now. Thanks for watching.